This is Twit. All righty, we are back from the break, and I have to tell you, I am super excited because we have the Vice President of Developer Relations for GitHub joining us today to talk about GitHub Universe. It's Martin Woodward. Welcome to the show, Martin. Hey, Micah. Thanks for having me on. It's great to be here. Thank you for taking the time to join us. I know it's been a busy, 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 busy <laughs> week for you. So it really is wonderful to have you here uh, with us today and uh, getting to talk about all of the fun stuff that's been announced at GitHub Universe. Before we do talk about those announcements, though, I think it's important. Not everybody knows about GitHub Universe. So what is GitHub Universe? Sure. Yeah. So GitHub Universe is um, an annual conference we do, usually here in San Francisco, where we bring the whole community of developers um, into a different place. This year it's Fort Mason, and then we all come in, listen about the latest news in tech, see the latest product announcements from GitHub, and generally have good vibes. It was a great kind of get together of a lot of people from open source community and the enterprise communities and things getting together and, and meeting. So that was good. Awesome. Yeah, I noticed that from the show floor, there were lots of different booths and things like that. Um, who tends to be, you know, joining from that community? Are there some big names? Uh, I know it's it, listen, people, it's not about favoritism. It's just big names that, you know, people would would recognize, for example. Um, and now, of course, it's not coming to me. But at one point I saw in the oh, Figma uh, was was it was in the background there. Are there other big names like that that, that pop up and are they there to uh, show off the offerings that they have or are they there to like mostly attend the conference and see what GitHub has uh, rolling out? Yeah, this, it, it's a trade show. So, you know, you have lots of people there from across um, the whole development world, really. Uh, GitHub being the center of the developer ecosystem. So lots of different people come in. So you had Figma, IBM, Red Hat, you know, you've got um, partners like Datadog and things. And you also have like Microsoft, Azure were there, different people who want to go talk to developers who they know are using GitHub as, as the platform kind of thing. They want to come and exhibit. It, it was a good show. Awesome. Yeah. And so let's let's get into the show, uh, because, you know, over the course of those two days of, of you know, keynotes and the presentations, mm -hmm. a lot was announced. But I think, um, well, we can use a nice GitHub uh, blog post to sort of narrow it down to some of the big announcements surrounding uh, Copilot and some of the tools therein. Uh, first and foremost, uh, there was a big talk about the multi model. Very important that we we differentiate not multi modal, modal model <laughs> multi model <laughs> Copilot. What does that mean for someone who hears that and is going, wait, okay, huh? Uh, exactly. It's like Spideyverse, isn't it? You know. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, for people that don't know, um, GitHub Copilot is a developer tool that helps you use the power of AI and large language models to help you code. Um, you know, people can use kind of um, ChatGPT or Claude or something like that to go and write code in the browser and it can give them some code. But uh, Copilot brings in the context of your development environment, brings in context of everything else, um, uses some models, packages up that data and then sends it to a prompt and then gives you back an answer. So it, it helps you code uh, very easily. So lots of developers use it. It's used by, gosh, I think it's like 1.8 million Copilot users now across wow. the world. Um, and including there's over a million kind of students and teachers and open source maintainers use it for free. So, you know, it's, it's used by a lot of people. Um, oh, yeah, previously, yeah, lots. And, and previously that was all um, uh, being used. It was using kind of the latest models from OpenAI. So we've been through different versions, you know, uh, it started off with um, a fine tuned version of GPT-3 and now it's running GPT-4.0. What we announced at the show was actually developers now have the choice um, between uh, GPT-4.0 or Claude 3.5 Sonnets, which is a, a cool new LLM that lots of uh, developers are getting into. And then also, probably the most surprisingly to the developer audience, um, uh, Google's Gemini 1.5 Pro as well. So it's across the whole ecosystem, you're able to kind of use the, use the LLM that you want to help you, you know, solve that problem. 
Yeah. And, you know, I think I'll make that external observation uh, of the surprise there. Definitely knowing that GitHub is under the umbrella that is Microsoft, uh, I, I too was pretty uh, kind of excited to see that you can you can go across the the aisle so to speak and that people would be able to use Google Gemini as part of that experience and i think the cool thing that that does is it really does help separate copilot from the what we've known to be the underlying technology up to this point in 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 some ways i know it's not entirely mm -hmm. that but thinking of it as an open ai gpt tool uh to being sort of agnostic and being able to, you know, change the underlying tooling. Now, one of the things that I actually wanted to talk to you about with this conference is that many, if not most, if not all of the demonstrations were very much live. And mm -hmm. what I, I'm kind of curious, uh, just your take on that, because I, I, will, I will explain it again from an external perspective to say that I have appreciated seeing uh, different companies that are showing off, in particular, AI technologies doing live demos and mm -hmm. rolling with the system because it feels more honest, it feels more authentic, and it also teaches people how to go about, you know, uh, dealing with a prompt and a, and a response that maybe is unexpected or goes one way and trying to make changes therein. Um, is that, is that a, a, a conscious effort uh, in setting up a conference like this and showing off tools that involve generative AI for you? It is for me. Um, developers are skeptical by nature, you know, and so I think you have to show the tool as it's really being used to prove it's real. Um, with these, you know, large language models with a lot of generative AI, um, you get amazing results sometimes from all of them, but they're non-deterministic. And so uh, we, they don't do the same thing every time. And so, you, you know, you need to kind of show what it really is like to use for a developer to trust that this is a tool that they want to try. And so we, we insist on doing live demos during our keynotes, um, during the breakout sessions as much as we can, um, just to give people that authentic experience, which makes it fun for us because you kind of, you know, you, you want to go, yeah, yeah, I knew this was totally going to do this, you know, and you sort of, it's kind of a, a trust fall into the AI to make sure it's going to work. So there's, there's lots of rehearsals and there's lots of kind of practices. Uh, and you also have to be quite a good coder to be up there on stage. Cassidy Williams, who's up on stage, did the co-pilot demo. Um, she's an amazing, amazing coder. Um, and you kind of have to so that you can, you know, you're checking, yep, that code makes sense, great, while you're talking talking and cracking really bad git puns you know? <laughs> yeah well, but hey it is... we'll branch out from doing git puns that's not difficult yeah. <laughs> there we go that's good it's very difficult though oh man that is i can't imagine because you know while i'm doing this show and i'm talking to you there are things that are going on in the background and i already have you know the the level of ability to do that, I can't imagine also trying to go, that code actually, that's that's true skill. Um, the, another tool that was shown off um, that uh, honestly I was pretty excited about um, is called GitHub Spark. And yeah. I was curious if you could tell us a little bit about GitHub Spark and uh, maybe kind of where this tool came from? Like, is it, has it always been something that was planned? Did, did something come along and you're like, you know what, this is what, what makes sense next. It just seems like in my opinion, a natural evolution of things, but I'm curious if that's kind of what it was just a natural evolution. So as we've been using a lot of the AI tools, um, we're finding that it's, you get this ability to code with natural language. And so, uh, and by that I mean, you know, speak human and get code kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
And uh, we have an, a team called GitHub Next that are our you know, R&D arm or research arm. And so they kind of wanted to take that and explore it to its ultimate. What if we focus around the language prompt itself? How can we create a structure which allows people who are technical, but not necessarily expert coders or not coders at all, to be able to become developers, to be able to code. GitHub have a goal of helping the world create eight you know, create a billion developers in the world. Um, there's only 8 billion people, so we need to obviously make it easier for people to code. And an interface like Spark, where somebody like you, Micah, who's, who's technical but not a coder, or somebody like Leo, who knows how to code but doesn't code all the time, can kind of type some prompts in, can kind of say, hey, build me this kind of app, do this, do that, and can iterate and build a, an application that, that works for them, that solves their problem, and deploys it and has it running in a working website with the working database back end all from a single prompt. It's pretty magical. Yeah, uh, seeing some of the examples on stage were uh, it, certainly inspiring because you kind of can go from there and go, oh, here's something. And I like the idea of, of being able to use it maybe as a means of, I, I don't know, it started there for me and I took it and said, okay, now what if I could feed it kind of these custom code sets and get help when I am doing little coding projects. Cause I've got, you know, a couple devices like a certain, uh, hackable badge, mm -hmm. but also, um, a little led display and they each use kind of their own flavors of, of, uh, coding language. And if I could give it the documentation and then kind of here's what I've made, here's the part where I'm struggling. I love this idea of sort of a collaborative um, building tool because that's how I learned how to do web development coding in the first place was kind of playing back and forth between those two things and uh, learning HTML, CSS, and uh, at the time, a little bit of JavaScript. Uh, and all of that was kind of in this play and create space. And so I do think that, you know, on the face of it, it may seem like something that is um, all and entirely a way to just, you know, type in some words and get something out. But mm -hmm. I think that folks shouldn't forget that this is also an opportunity to inspire people to reach further because you start there and then you go, but now I want to change it like this. And then you actually learn how to do it to change it like that after you've seen it being built. So I think it's going to inspire people in, in so many ways. And that's one thing where it feels very in line with Microsoft because we've seen them do a, it do a lot of low code, no code stuff on the enterprise side. Um, so in that way, I thought, oh, you know, GitHub Spark here as this tool seems pretty cool. Now, that is kind of uh, there on the um, sort of it feels more consumer reaching. There was also a lot when it came to. Uh, the developer experience with GitHub, um, GitHub Copilot and VS Code, Copilot Workspace, um, Copilot Autofix. Uh, before we let you go, could you tell us a little bit about those other kind of grab bag things that have come? Although I'm sure for the teams who work on it, it doesn't feel grab bag, but it, it kind of got grouped into one little category there. Yeah, I mean, there's a blog post you can read with like, uh, you know, over 50 features that were shipped at the event. But uh, I think probably what was also interesting is, you know, it's an event where we bring the community together. Um, so as well as all the features, which get shipped, which is cool, we're also celebrating the fact that actually, um, the community on GitHub, Python, is actually now the number one language that we're seeing people build products in on GitHub, overtaking JavaScript, um, wow. which is fascinating. Um, and that kind of shows you again, that's a different kind of community is coming into code. You know, the Python developers, there's lots of people from maths backgrounds, from science backgrounds, makers and hobbyists and things coming into coding. And it just shows you how the community is really growing and continues to grow year over year. And new people come into coding, which helps everybody because then we can, you know, solve problems through code and, you know, get better. And, and it's also across the whole world as well. We're seeing, you know, a massive rise in the amount of people coming from India, uh, and from Brazil and different countries as well, all joining this this ecosystem that used to be quite you know Bay Area centric, really. Absolutely, yeah. Um, anything else that you want to mention from the event? Maybe one thing that really for you you're you're excited to tell people about, or that you've liked playing around with uh, before we let you go. 
Yeah, I mean, so I do a lot of large language model development and a lot of um, you know development around AI tools. And so we actually shipped a product called GitHub Models, and that allows you to um, take one model and compare it side by side with another model, um, feed it the same prompts, have the same system prompts, and then compare the results oh. and compare things like how quickly it gives you the results. Because some models, you know, take a bit longer, use more processing time, are more expensive, but give you more data, more reason behind it. Whereas there are models that are much quicker, but maybe don't give you quite the same reason, quite the same responses. <clears throat> and so this allows us to give you that, you know, allow you to compare the models side by side, have the choice and see which models fit for purpose. Because there's no point spending, you know, dollars per kind of prompt when you could actually spend less than a cent per prompt um, and, and get good enough results back. So that that's probably the coolest thing for me, the thing I'll probably use the most, to be honest. Very, very cool. Yeah, I love that idea. Like you said, depending on what the developer is making, maybe they don't need to have the more uh, robust model and they could save some money. Oh, this one provides exactly what I need and I don't need more. It's just determining, is there a uh, a pumpkin in the photo or is there not a pumpkin in the photo? I don't necessarily need the highest level of reasoning from an app. I can just use something that's a little bit more, um, like you said, cost effective. Uh, Martin Woodward, I want to thank you so very much again for taking the time this week on a very busy week to join us here on the show and help us understand some of the fun stuff that uh, GitHub has announced. Uh, congrats on what has been an excellent uh, another GitHub universe. If people would like to follow along with what's going on, um, where are some places they can go to, to stay up to date? Well, they can just uh, go to github.com. That gives you the latest results. And then also, um, you, you know, you can follow us as well. I'm, I'm Martin Woodward on most social media, including GitHub. So there we go. Awesome. Thank you so much and uh, hope to see you again soon.